Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm nearing the end of a teaching that I've been doing on the believer's authority. This week, I've been talking against the approach that many people take to spiritual warfare. You know, we've talked about our authority, and of course, our authority is not against people, it's against demonic things. It says this in Ephesians chapter 6, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so, anytime you talk about the authority of the believer, you have to also talk about our enemy and how we have to resist the devil James 4, 7, and he will flee from us. And so I've been talking about this and saying that I believe that there is a demonic realm and there are demonic spirits. You know, I just prayed with a woman who had cancer and I believe it was totally demonic and I rebuked that stuff and cast it out of her. I believe that demonic things exist, but the way you overcome the demonic realm isn't just by rebuking the devil. You have to get the truth. Satan fights against us with lies and deceptions. That's the reason that I've entitled this last teaching in my series on the believer's authority as the battle is in the mind. The battle's not out there in some spiritual realm. The battle is in the mind. Satan comes against people with lies and deception. And so what I want to do today and tomorrow is to take some Old Testament examples that are often used as ways that we are supposed to do spiritual warfare. And I want to use them and show you that there is a difference between the way people interceded and pleaded with God in the Old Testament and the way it's done in the New Testament. And I think that the majority, not all, but the majority of spiritual warfare today is done based on this Old Testament model and it is not honoring what Jesus has done for us. So here's one example. I've heard this used many times, and this is after Moses had been up on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. God had given him the two tables uh, that contained the Ten Commandments, and then the Lord spoke to him in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 7, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. You know, I think this is always been kind of humorous to me. I don't know exactly what to make out of it, but when the Lord told Moses to go down to Egypt, he says, you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But now after he had brought them out and they had turned to idolatry and were living so perverted, the Lord says, go down for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. It's like the Lord wasn't going to claim them anymore. <laughs> it's always an amazing thing. In verse 8 it says, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. Now I'm going to go on and read some more of this story, but in this 10th verse, this is amazing. He's telling Moses, he says, leave me alone so that I can vent my wrath on them. And he's saying in effect that Moses, I love you and respect you enough that if you go to interceding for these people, you aren't going to allow me to do what I really want to. So here is in, infinite, almighty God talking to a finite man and saying, you have pull with me. You have authority with me. I honor and value your opinion and your intercession. You know, that's an amazing, amazing fact. And it's not because Moses was the sharpest knife in the drawer. You know, I'm not trying to put Moses down, but I'm saying God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. Moses took a word from God and made a paragraph out of it. He killed an Egyptian thinking that that was the way that God was going to bring deliverance. And he cost himself 40 years in the wilderness and the children of Israel 30 years extra bondage. Moses had made some serious mistakes even to the point of killing a person. And it wasn't a justified uh, you know, it wasn't self-defense. He killed a person thinking that this was how God was going to bring the Jews out of Egypt. You can read about that in Acts chapter 7. 
And so it was murder. This was a man who was a murderer, and yet God valued his opinion. It wasn't because Moses was the greatest person or he was a perfect person. It was because of God's great love. And Moses had responded to God, and Moses had trusted God and believed God, and it's faith that pleases God, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. So we can see through this that this shows the tremendous uh, love of God towards us, that He would make Himself to a place that we could influence Him. And this is what he's telling Moses. He says, Moses, get out of my way. I don't want you to influence me. Don't intercede for these people. And then in verse 11, it says, Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? You know, in a sense, what he's doing is he's saying, God, what's this going to do to your reputation? What about these people that saw all your mighty power and works and they know that it was you that brought them out, but then you're going to kill all of these people that you delivered? It's going to hurt your reputation. Man, this is not a good PR move. You know, that's amazing to me, but this is exactly what Moses is saying. Think about how this, how this is going to be interpreted by people. What are people going to think about you? And then he said this in the latter part of the 12th verse. He said, turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Moses told God to repent. You know, that is absolutely astounding. And again, if it wasn't the fact that we have a wonderful, loving, kind God, even in the Old Testament, before our debt was paid, when wrath was still against His people, even then we have a merciful God. Or I guarantee you, most of us, if you had some person that you created talk to you this way and say, what are people going to think about you? It's going to hurt your reputation. Turn, repent. I guarantee you, most of us, if we were almighty God, would have just turned them into a pile of ashes right there. But you know what's amazing? It's amazing that Moses said, repent of this evil against thy people. But here's even more amazing thing. In verse 14, it says, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. It's amazing that Moses got by with saying, repent. And then it's amazing that God loved his people and honored and respected Moses enough that he responded to a man and repented. That's amazing. And anyway, the reason I bring this out is to say I've heard people use this exact thing that this is the way that we are supposed to pray today and tell God to repent. God, don't destroy the United States or whatever nation it is that you're watching this program in. But don't destroy this country. God, turn from your fierce wrath. Don't pour out your judgment. And people use this, and that's exactly what Moses did. But let me read a New Testament scripture to you out of 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. If you put this together with Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. That's talking about Jesus, to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. This is speaking about Moses. If you read it in context, it's talking about that the law was given to Moses. Moses was the mediator between God and man. The word mediator means that it, we, another word that we would use for it today would be uh, like an arbitrator. You have these two parties that are opposed to each other and you bring in an arbitrator or a mediator to try and reconcile them and to bring them into some kind of a compromise so that there won't be this animosity and anger between them. And so Moses was a mediator. He stood between God and man. And God was going to wipe out all of the Israelite nation because of their sin. And Moses mediated, arbitrated, and said, Turn from your fierce wrath. Repent of this evil. And God repented. Moses was a mediator. But in the New Testament, there is only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. 
It was appropriate for Moses to do what he did because Jesus hadn't come. Sins had not been paid for. They were killing animals and offering their blood, but it says over in Hebrews that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sins. It was only symbolic. It really didn't appease anything. It was just pointing, it was a picture, a type, and a shadow pointing towards something that Jesus was going to do. So in the Old Testament, sins had not been atoned for, and there was wrath from God towards men, and therefore there needed to be mediators, intercessors that stood between an angry God and the people that deserved His judgment. And it was appropriate for Moses to do what he did in Exodus chapter 32. But if somehow or another we could just take Moses and translate him into the, the time in which we live after the death and the resurrection and the mediation of Jesus, and if Moses tried to plead with God now the way that he did in Exodus chapter 32, he would be against everything that Jesus came to do. Jesus paid for our sins to such a degree that God is no longer angry. And I know that what I'm saying right here goes against so much religious stuff that many people may swallow hard and not totally embrace what I'm saying. But I'm telling you that it's, it's being said that God is angry with America and with Europe and with different places and that His judgment is coming upon these people. That's not true. It is true that in the Old Testament you can find many, many, many examples of God's judgment falling on nations and prophecies about it. But in the New Testament, Jesus atoned for our sins and the wrath of God has been satisfied and God is not going to judge America. You know, when I first got started in ministry, I was coming from a very legalistic, condemning background and one of the statements that I heard often and that I even repeated was that if God doesn't judge America for our sins, then he's going to have to apologize for Sodom and Gomorrah. And the logic behind that was that America is becoming as immoral and un ungodly as Sodom and Gomorrah. And I don't really think that many people could argue with that. I mean, over the last generation, America's morality has gone in the toilet. And I, the point was that, you know, America is as deserving of judgment as Sodom and Gomorrah is. And that's true if you're just looking in the natural realm. But there's a huge difference between the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and the days in which we live. And that difference is Jesus. Jesus came and took the sins of the entire world upon Himself and paid for it. And He bore all of God's wrath, not just some of it, all of God's wrath against sin was borne by Jesus. Sins have been paid for. It says in 1 John chapter 2 that He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the entire world have been paid for. Does that mean that everybody's saved, that everybody's born again? No. The payment has been made but you have to confess Jesus as your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. You have to receive that salvation. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that we're saved by grace through faith. Grace is what God does for us. He's already paid for the sins of the whole world, but you have to mix it with faith. If you don't put faith in God's grace, then even though the provision is there, it will not apply to you. So I'm saying that Jesus has already taken care of God's wrath. God's not angry, but you have to receive that forgiveness in order to uh, receive all of the benefits of this. But see, there's a difference between today and back in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. I used to say if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But now I say that if God does judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Jesus because Jesus paid for our sins. Now, does this mean that since God has paid for our sins through Jesus, that it doesn't matter if we live in sin? Therefore, we can be as ungodly as Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's no, no uh, downside to it. Absolutely untrue. Because even though God isn't holding our sins against us, Satan gains inroad to us through our sins. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not 
that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, you are giving Satan inroad in your life. And John 10, 10 says that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Satan is out to eat your lunch and pop the bag. He'll destroy you if you let him. So even though God isn't going to judge America because he would have to apologize to Jesus, Jesus has already paid for our sins. Our sins are still opening up a huge inroad to the devil. And Satan is in the process of destroying America. If we don't turn to God, if we don't return to morality and begin to take a stand against all of this ungodliness that's being loosed, America will not stand. But not because God judged it, but because we forsook our own mercies. Jonah chapter 2 verse 8 says that. So Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. And because of that, you can't intercede the way that Moses did because Jesus hadn't come. He hadn't paid for our sins. Therefore, it was appropriate for Moses to step in between and plead for mercy with God. But if you try and do that in the New Testament after Jesus has come and already pled for God's mercy and paid the total price, and now you go to pleading for mercy, you know what you're saying? You're saying you don't believe Jesus did enough. You don't believe he did it all. You believe that you have to also stand there. You, in a sense, are, are becoming a mediator. And I know many of you, this, I'm saying this to try and, and get my point across. This might be offensive to some of you, but when you have that attitude and you go to pleading for God not to judge America and, oh, don't judge this person and all of this, you are taking the place of what Christ has done. Now, I know we've been taught to do this by our religion, but it's wrong. And in a sense, it's anti-Christ. It's against what Jesus did. And there is a lot of stuff in the body of Christ today that is anti-Christ. It is against what he's done, saying that Jesus didn't pay it all, that we have to intercede and we have to plead with God to turn from his wrath. It was appropriate for Moses. It's inappropriate for you and me because we now have Jesus, the only mediator between God and man, and you can't take his place. You can't add to what he did. The only thing you can do is humble yourself and receive it. You know, this same thing happened in Genesis chapter 18 with Abraham. And in Genesis 18, the Lord meant with three men. We found out it was the Lord and two angels. And then two of the angels were sent to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if it was as bad as what the reports were. And the Lord stood there before Abraham. And uh, the Lord had told Abraham that if I find out that this report is true, then I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham began to intercede with God. And he started off with saying, Lord, if there was 50 righteous people in Sodom, would you destroy the city and destroy the righteous along with the wicked, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. That's not just. A just God certainly wouldn't do that. And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people, I will not destroy Sodom. And then he says, how about 45? And he said, I won't do it if I find 45. How about 40? And he said, I won't do it if I find 40. How about 30, 20, 10? And Abraham stopped at 10, assuming that surely there was at least 10 righteous people in Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. As it turned out, there weren't. The scripture says over in 2 Peter chapter 2 that this just man, speaking about Lot, he was a just man. He was a righteous man living there. There was at least one righteous person there. But anyway, the Lord couldn't find 10 righteous people and so he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what Abraham was doing? He was being a mediator between an angry God and the people that he was angry with. And he was pleading with God for mercy. And I believe that if he would have just gone down and says, God, if you found one righteous person, I believe that that probably would have stopped God from destroying Sodom and Gomorrah because it says that Lot was a righteous man. But he just quit his intercession. Now, let me say two things here. The first thing I want to say, even if you forget Jesus now has come and pled with God and has paid the price and that all of this type of intercession is over, even if you didn't factor in New Testament intercession, if you just go by this example in Genesis chapter 18, God is not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. And even though America and 
every other place that I'm aware of has become increasingly wicked and is worthy of God's judgment. There are righteous people in America. There are righteous people in these other nations. And even if you didn't factor the New Testament in, God wouldn't destroy this nation because there are righteous people in this nation. And we see that in Genesis chapter 18. But when you factor in the New Covenant, Jesus has now paid for our sins. He's not only pled with God, but He paid our debt. He suffered the wrath and the punishment and the rejection of God. And God now will never destroy a nation. Now there's coming a time in the end of times when he comes back and establishes a physical kingdom that he's going to start doing this and he's going to come against and there's a sword that comes out of his mouth and he's going to destroy his enemies. But right now we're living in this period of grace and God is not destroying nations. He's not judging nations or individuals. Jesus has settled that. Again, there is still impending destruction for many of these nations because we've forsaken God and we've forsaken our own mercies and we're walking away and opening up a huge inroad of Satan into our lives and into our nations and there is impending doom if we don't come back to God. But it's not because God's going to judge us, it's because the enemy is going to destroy us. And so there still is a need for us to turn from our things. But I'm saying that Jesus is the mediator between God and man to end this kind of mediation, intercession that is being promoted and taught so much in the body of Christ today. People are approaching God as if He's an angry God and they're saying, turn from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil the way that Moses did in Exodus chapter 32. And I tell you, that is a slap in the face of Jesus. You don't understand that Jesus has already atone for our sins. He's already appeased the wrath of God. He has mediated so that now there is no need for that type of intercession and mediation anymore. <laughs> 